Praise God. Did you bring a Bible? Okay, we're going to look at a few passages of Scripture today. You know, I've been talking in the last weeks about the rapture. I've been talking mostly about the time of the rapture, like when will the believing be leaving? That's kind of been the message. When? When will the believing be leaving? And, you know, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, I think we've hopefully pretty much settled that issue. Today, I want to talk about something different, but yet the same. Today, I want to talk about, will all the believing be leaving? Amen. You see, there are two schools of thought about the rapture. We believe there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. That before the great tribulation begins, there's going to be an exit. An exit of the, the bride of Christ, the true church, the overcomers, the first fruits. The general consensus among pre-tribulation believers is that there will be one great big general rapture. And everybody who is a believer, no matter what their spiritual condition, but everybody who is a believer will, will go in the rapture because, you know, they, they're believers. And they believe that God would not separate, he would not separate some believers from other believers because, you know, that now you've got a separated church. The church is already separated, by the way. It's separated because there are those who are with the Lord right now, and then there are those of us down here. And it's separated in other ways as well. There is such a thing as a carnal Christian. Paul talks about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you not carnal, he said, because of all the strife and division among you? People with hard hearts, people with unforgiveness, people with bad attitudes. That still exists, you know. And there are people who are just hard to get along with. In Revelation chapter 14, <laughs> thank you, sister. I hope I'm not one of those people that's hard to get along with. <laughs> in Revelation chapter 14, there is an interesting statement here. I, I, I do want to read Revelation chapter 14 uh, about a group of 144,000 in heaven. Now, this isn't going to be a study in the book of Revelation. Revelation actually speaks of a group of 144,000 in chapter 7. Chapter 7, it specifically says there are 144,000 Jews. They are from the 12 tribes of Israel. They are on the earth during the Great Tribulation, and they are doing a fantastic job of world evangelism. But then you've got a group in heaven of 144,000 simultaneous at the same time as this group on earth. This group, in verse 1, says, I looked, and, and a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, in Revelation, in, in the chapter 3 and verse 12, the, father, the name of the God, the name of the Father written on the foreheads is promised to the overcomers, those who overcome. And in verse 2, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it was a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth. 144,000 redeemed from the earth. These are not Jews. They're redeemed from all over the earth. They may have some Jews in that number. These are they which are not defiled with women. Not that women are defiling, but it's speaking in a spiritual sense here. They are not immoral. They were godly. Look, for they are virgins. The Bible speaks always of, in the spiritual sense, of a virgin as someone who has saved themselves from the pollutions of the world. One who has set themselves apart from the pollutions and defilements of the world. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits 
unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. God sees them. God accounts them clean, holy, separated. Speaks of them in, it speaks of them as a different kind of person almost altogether. And it uses the term first fruits. The first fruits. Now, in the, those who, who believe that the rapture may not be as general as people think. Actually, I hope that there is one big, great big general rapture and everybody goes. But the more I have read the Bible, the less I can ascribe to that view. Because there are so many admonitions to watch, to pray, to be ready. Don't be found. Don't be found in the world when the Lord comes. All of these warnings, all of these exhortations, all of these admonitions, why are they there if everybody goes all at the same time? Because then it doesn't matter how you live. Are y'all following me? If it doesn't matter how you live, everybody goes automatically. If you're a believer, then you go, you've got the fervent, you've got the faithful, you've got those who are, are serving the Lord, following the Lord, and then you've got those who really are Christians. Sometimes you can't tell the tares from the wheat, the Bible says. But there are those who are believers, but you know they're backslidden, they're worldly, they're carnal. They're not living a life like they should. You've got the lukewarm. You've got the apathetic. You've got the Laodicean. You've got the half-hearted. We can't tell who's, who's really genuinely following the Lord, who's a real believer, a faithful, fervent believer, and those who are just hanging on the sidelines. Maybe, maybe one foot in the world and one foot in the church. You see, I don't believe the Bible teaches the Lord is going to rapture out of earth halfway Christians. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. He says right here that these are the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. I'm of the persuasion. See, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And then I'm going to tell you. And then I'm going to tell you what I told you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. That way we cover it all. The Bible speaks of the first fruits. Now, let me tell you what the first fruits are. In the Old Testament, the first fruits were separated, and out of the first fruits came the offerings, the gifts, the tithes for the Lord. They came from the first fruits. Always the first fruits, they were the Lord's, the Bible says. Out of the first fruits. You don't give God what's last. Or least, you give God what's best. You give God what's ripe. First fruits simply means you ever grow figs? You ever grow, have you ever grown vegetables or fruit or anything like that? You will know that there is some fruit on the same tree that ripens before others. Some is ready to pick and eat, and some is still hard. And then it's just not ready. It doesn't mean it's not fruit. It doesn't mean it won't get ready or that it won't one day be ready to be picked. It's just not ready right now. There are many, many, many passages in the Bible that tell us you need to be ready. You need to be ready when the Lord comes. You need to be ready when the Lord calls. And why this emphasis, if it doesn't matter, if it doesn't matter, you see, too many Christians are still dabbling in the world. In 1927, Smith Wigglesworth, y'all remember reading anything about Smith Wigglesworth? Now, he was no theologian, to be sure, but he heard from God. He definitely was somebody who heard from God, and, and when he prayed, God answered. In 1927, he prophesied. And in 1927, he said, when the Lord comes... It's probably not half the church that's going to be ready. Wow. Pretty strong, pretty strong language. And you, then you've got people like Billy Graham, who was not a prophet, but definitely had an evangelistic calling and led multitudes to Christ, who said he didn't believe 10% 
of the church. More, he didn't believe more than 10% was actually saved. Wow. That there were multitudes in the church who really weren't saved. This, this today is to emphasize to you and me, this is not the time to be apathetic, lukewarm, indifferent, grow cold, grow callous, and think, well, the Lord has delayed his coming. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Because we, we have read repeatedly that the Lord's coming is going to be like a thief in the night, unexpected, unannounced, and multitudes, multitudes will not be ready. And then it's going to be too late, you see, to be a part of that first fruits company that is ready, that's ripe. That doesn't mean they won't be fruit, that they won't be, that they won't be saved. Because I believe there's some that are genuine figs and genuine, you know, fruit. They're just not ready. They're not ready for the picker. Y'all with me? Many, many passages tell us about how we're to be ready. Philippians 3 and verse 20 talks about, you don't have to turn there, but our conversation, our life, our citizenship is in heaven. From where we also look. For our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be living that way, by the way. We habitually look. We're looking for our Lord. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What about those who are not looking for him? What about those who are immersed in the world, that they think this is a playground and not a battleground? You see, for the Christian, this world's a battleground. I mean, we're in, we're in battle every day. You're battling to keep your eyes under control, your mind, your thoughts under control, your heart right. It's a battle every day. People tell you things and you want to respond in a way you know you shouldn't. You've got to keep this mouth in check. What a challenge that is. To not say it. Don't say it. And everything in you says, say it, say it. Go ahead and say it. Tell them, tell them, say it. You make the best speech you ever regret. <laughs> Titus 2 and verse 12 tells, or verse 13 tells us we're to be looking for that blessed hope. This is how we live. We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we live, looking for that. Did I mention that you should have been turning to Matthew 24? No. I'd like you to make your way over there if you would. <laughs> but I wanted to point out this passage about the first fruits because we're going to be talking about that some more in just a few minutes. Matthew 24. Notice the warnings in this passage. I'm just going to read a couple of verses right now, but we're going to read more of this in a minute. Verse 42, Matthew 24, 42. This is the Lord's own words. Watch, therefore, watch, for you do not know what hour your Lord does come. But know this, that if the homeowner, the goodman of the house, had known what watch the thief would come, what time of the night the thief would come, he would have watched. And he would not have allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Be ye also ready. We've got so many admonitions to watch, to be ready, to pray. Or Luke 21, Luke 21, 36. Well, 34, 35, 36. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged. With surfeiting, overcharged, overwhelmed idea is really burdened down with just a worldly life. Don't let your heart be burdened down with a worldly life. And it goes on, and drunkenness and the cares of this life, because we know, we know what this does. You start settling into this world, you become like them. You become adopting their ways, you start adopting their ways, you start talking like them, acting like them. Seeking their same forms of entertainment. Take heed to yourselves. This is something we must constantly be on guard over ourselves. Amen. We've got to guard this self 
lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Boy, that's a snare too. You know, because it seems like possessions come with hooks attached. They want to drag you in. So we, we always, not, nothing wrong with having possessions, we hold them lightly. Hold them lightly because you're going to have to let them go, you know. Can't take anything with you. You're going to have to let it all go. Hold it lightly. Like Corey Tin Boom said, hold everything you have lightly so that when God takes it away, you don't have to pry it out of your fingers. Yes, it does. He goes on and says, don't let your hearts be overcome with these things, with surfeiting, with drunkenness, with the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unaware when you're not ready. See, you get burdened down. You get overwhelmed. You get caught up in it all. It ties you. It hooks you. He says, Luke 26, 36, Luke 21, 36, for as a snare, it will come upon the whole earth. That day is going to come as a snare upon the earth, a trap. It's going to come like a trap upon the whole earth, on all them that dwell in the face of the whole earth. And then he says, Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. We want to be found worthy. We, in this sense, we're not worthy, but we want to be accounted worthy. Like those first fruits, they were accounted without fault before the Lord and blameless. The Lord has called us, each and every one of us, to live a godly life right here and right now. Godliness is not just for when you get to heaven. There will be no sin in heaven. There will be no temptation in heaven. There will be no, no devil there to tempt us and no demons there to tempt us and no bad influences there to tempt us. It's right here where the challenge is to live godly, to guard that heart, guard that mind, guard those thoughts. Titus 2, he says, beginning in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, Teaching us, grace teaches us something. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we're to deny these things, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In this present world. Looking for, looking for that blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is not the time to be a compromised believer. This is not the time to be half-hearted. This is the time to check ourselves, examine ourselves, and make sure that our lifestyle actually lines up with the faith in Christ that we profess to have. We want our lifestyle to line up with the faith that we profess to have. Amen. Amen. That means all that it means, a godly life in an ungodly world. I cannot give, I cannot give a halfway Christian any assurance that the Lord's coming for him or her to catch him away from all the trouble and trials that are coming to this world. It could be that multitudes will not be ready when the first fruits picking takes place and that they'll be left behind because they're hard. They're not ripe. They're not ready. They'll be left behind to ripen. And, and you know the thing that will ripen you real quick, trial, trouble, tribulation, affliction, distress, persecution, all of which will characterize the great tribulation. I do believe that there is nothing that has to be done in this world before the rapture could take place. Nothing has to be accomplished. No sign has to appear. In fact, if you start thinking about, as it was in the days of Noah, violence covered the earth in Noah's day. 
ungodliness, wickedness of all kinds, as it was in the days of Lot. What was Sodom like? Well, you know, they were overrun with sexual perversion. They were flaunting it. They were parading it. They were proud of it. They were celebrating every kind of perversity you can imagine. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, that's the way it's going to be in the coming of the Son of Man. I think we're there. I think we're there. So if you're looking for maybe the Lord could be coming at any time, uh, I think you better start thinking about right now. Are you in Matthew 24? All right. I want to look at a couple of verses over here that are often cited by many as passages that teach the rapture. Some say it, it doesn't teach the rapture. Some say it does. Some say it teaches judgment. I'm going to tell you why I believe it does teach a rapture. Uh, Matthew 24, 36, notice what the Lord says. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, we're in Matthew 24, which is predominantly a passage, a chapter that deals with the Jews during the Great Tribulation. I mean, that's why he tells them, let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains and pray that you're, you know, you're not fleeing on the Sabbath. It predominantly deals with the Jews during the Great Tribulation, this whole chapter. But then when you get to verse 36, the Lord is returning to the original question that was asked to him all the way back in verse 3. Uh, uh, are, you, are you with me so far? Notice the question in verse 3. I'm in chapter 24, verse 3. The disciples came upon the Mount of Olives. The Lord was there. The disciples came. They said, tell us when these things will be. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Tell us about the end of the world. Tell us what's going to happen in the last days. And this entire chapter, he deals with that very thing. He gives them the whole panorama of what's going to happen. But then in verse 36, he returns to that original question. And says, but of that day, because they want to know, when is this going to happen? Tell us. Tell us about the end of the world. Tell us about the last days. What's going to happen? He returns to the original question right here. And he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not the angels of heaven, my father only. But then notice he starts talking about what conditions will be like before the rapture. As the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We have already well established that this, this refers, these conditions can only refer to the world before the great tribulation begins. As it was in the days of Noah. It was life as usual. They were marrying. They were buying. They were selling. They were coming. They were going. It was life as usual. Luke's account adds a lot to the, to the examples that are cited. Luke, in Luke 17, we've talked about that the past several weeks. As it was in the days of Lot, they did eat. They drank. They bought. They sold. They planted. They builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. This has to be a pre-tribulation rapture that's being referred to here. Because life is usual. Life is normal. Y'all following? Yes. Life will not be normal and usual during the great tribulation. No. Now let me tell you why this is important. Because... Matthew 24 basically deals with the Jews during the Great Tribulation. And there are multitudes who say that this passage, as all of Matthew 24, deals with the Jews during the Great Tribulation. This is the Jews during the Great Tribulation. In fact, it's the Jews at the end of the Great Tribulation. Just before Second Advent, just before the Lord returns to destroy the world, you know, and so forth. But it obviously cannot refer to that. It obviously cannot. Uh, not when you th remember what the world will be like, especially at the very end of the Great Tribulation. Uh, 
half the world's going to be dead. A fourth die in Revelation chapter 6, one-fourth of the earth's population. If there's eight billion, that's two billion people dead. Another third die over in Revelation chapter 9, a third die. So that's half the world's population that's dead. If the population's eight billion, that's four billion dead, and they're dying more and more every day. By the time you get to Revelation chapter 16, all the waters of the earth have been turned into blood. Not only the fresh water, but the salt water. The Bible says everything in the sea dies, every fish, everything that swims, everything in there is dead. Revelation 16, the sun has been given power to scorch the earth, to burn the earth up. I don't think people are going to be out planting and harvesting. And then, Revelation 16, hailstones are going to fall from heaven that weigh 100 pounds apiece. No. It's not going to be conditions as normal. They're not buying, they're not selling, they're not marrying, they're not giving in marriage. Look, dodge the hailstones, hurry up with this ceremony, let's... (laughs) This has to refer back to the original question, tell us about the last days, because... We want to know. Then he says in verse 40, I'm in Matthew 24, 40. Then shall two be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. The rapture is going to be selective. Some believe this refers to judgment. You know, the ones that are taken away are going to be judged. and, And the ones that are left are going to be the good guys. But... I see all of this going together, answering the question about the last days, the catching away, I believe, of the first fruits. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. The rapture will be selective. We know it's going to be selective. We know the, the unbeliever, the unsaved, isn't going. But by the time we get over to chapter 25 which follows the same train of thought, I want you to read about the possibility that not even everyone who professes to be a Christian is going to go. Because the Lord doesn't stop there. Obviously, he says, you are to watch, therefore, you don't know the the hour your Lord is coming. He says in verse 44, be ye also ready, be ye also ready, be ye also ready, be ye also ready. I'm sorry, did I get stuck there that... For at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. I guess we could ask ourselves, am I ready? Am I really ready? Am I ready? What if the Lord came today or tonight? Are there things I really need to repent of? That Are there things I need to get right with somebody else? Am I harboring something in my heart that shouldn't be there? Do I need to stop? doing certain things that I've been doing. It's time to get right right now. It's time to get your heart right, your attitude right, your mind right, your words right. Quit letting things slide. Quit letting things go. This is not a game. This is not a game. This is a life. This is a lifestyle. I want every one of us, including me, to be among the first fruits. I, I, I want us to be a, a ready people, a ready people. I, I don't want us to be like multitudes who are not only not ready, they're clueless about anything having to do with end-time events or what the Bible says about end-time events. We're raising up a whole generation of Christians today that are clueless. They have zero knowledge of end-time events, zero of end-time eschatology, and they're not interested. They want to know how to feel good, how to be a success in life, and so forth. Are you still with me in Matthew? Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise. Five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you, but go rather to them that buy and, and, and sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, and they that were ready, Amen. went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. I think we ought to underline that. In fact, I think we ought to highlight it, underline it, inscribe it in our minds. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The door is open right now, but that door will one day be shut. And afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. When he says, I don't know you, you notice that this isn't, this isn't like, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. This isn't, you know, consign them to outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He doesn't say any of those things. I believe you could make a case here that they were just not ready. They were not right. Doesn't mean they weren't virgins. The Bible says they were virgins. So if we were going to compare it to uh, first fruits, they were figs, but they weren't ripe. It doesn't mean the Lord has cut them off and abandoned them and thrown them into the fire, there'll be a time when they'll be ripe too. Y'all with me? I want you to notice, because, again, multitudes in Christianity, I mean, there are so many different views and opinions of these passages, but I do believe that if you consider what we've said so far, in the past several weeks, and if you consider what the Bible teaches about being ready, watching, prepared, this simply emphasizes that very thing. So, so those who say, well, this, this is a judgment when God separates the wheat from the tares, this is a judgment when God separates the church from the Jews or the saved from the unsaved, actually... I don't believe it is, because they're all here referred to as virgins. This is a term the Bible uses exclusively to designate the pure, the separate from the world. Paul Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Again, unspotted from the world, unsullied, unsoiled, separated unto the Lord. In Revelation 19 and verse 4, the Bible speaks about those who follow Christ. They're being called, I'm sorry, Revelation 14:4. Those who are called virgins, remember, they follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. They're not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Uh, they, they were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. So the virgins, spiritually, are those who have kept themselves pure. They are unpolluted from the world, undefiled uh, from spiritual corruption. And yet... And yet, they weren't ready. So I think the case could be made, I think it could easily be made, that these who are left behind, the virgins left behind, I I believe it's a picture of the church. Picture of the church, not all will be ready, not not all will go at the first fruits rapture. I want you to consider that a distinct possibility and that this particular passage could very well be indicative of that very thing. And hence, so many warnings, be ready, be watching. 
Because if you, if you are not ready, what if you're not ready? What if you're not watching? What if you're not among those who look for him for his appearing? What if you're among those who are so blended in with the world that you can't be told apart? You know what happens when you have no lamp? There's no lamp. Their lamps, their lamps go out. They've got no light. You're not shining any light. Those who are not shining any light blend in with the darkness. You just blend right in. You, you can't be told. Whether, well, well, wait, I just heard that person talk. You, you sure they're Christians? I just heard that joke they just told. You sure they're Christians? Oh, wait, I just, I just left that guy in the bar. You sure he's a Christian or she's a Christian? Outwardly, you've got ten virgins. Outwardly, they all were invited. All were invited to be a part, to participate. All had lamps. Outwardly, they looked the same. But they weren't the same. And what was the difference? Five were not ready. That's the difference. They were not ready. Now, you can imagine all kind of things that might constitute the oil. What does the oil mean? They didn't have oil in their lamps. You've got to go and buy it. And they said, no, you can't buy this. You've got to get it for yourself. You can't get mine. You've got to get it for yourself. We do know oil can be representative of the Holy Spirit. You know, we anoint with oil, presence of the Holy Spirit, presence of Christ. But... Really and truly, the bottom line, I believe, that we're, we're being taught in all of this passage is that the wise were prudent. They had lived prudently, thoughtfully, carefully, rather than carelessly neglecting their spiritual disciplines. They were ready. They were prepared in advance. They brought oil along with them because they were thoughtful. The others were negligent. You know, it's so easy to put decisions off for another day. Like, you know, I know I need to get some things right. I need to get some oil in my lamp. I need to get some things right. I need to apologize to somebody. In fact, I really need to make restitution. I know I need to humble myself, but I just, I, I'm, I am going to do it one of these days. I know I got to get a hold of this tongue. I know it. I know I've got it, and, and, and I'm going to do that uh, pretty soon. I know there's some habits I really need to break. There's some things that are, are, are polluting my spirit, and I, I just need to stop. I need to get the victory over this pornography. Uh, whatever it is, you, you fill in the blanks. The Bible says five of the virgins were wise and five were foolish. Five were negligent. If this passage teaches us anything, they that went to buy the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. It is possible to be inadequately prepared for the coming of the Lord. It is possible to not be ready. I believe it's possible to be saved and not ready. There's a lot of saved people that, that you wouldn't even know they were saved by the way they live. By their actions, their words, the things they allow themselves to do. There are virgins who come out and separate themselves and dedicate themselves. They'll follow the terminology and, the, and, and what the Lord is saying in this passage. I do believe that it's possible to not be ready. There's this interesting passage over here in verse 5. Notice this. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Of course, 
I think, I think the ready, they slept the sleep of peace because they were right with the Lord. They had peace in their minds and hearts. But, you know, there are others who sleep the sleep of folly Amen. because they think in some convoluted way that they're good. I'm good. I believe in Jesus. I'm good. No matter how they live. Those who hold to the general rapture view believe that you can't separate the body of Christ like that and, and, and call some up, leave some behind, because they equate the rapture with salvation itself. All are saved. If you're saved, you're saved. That's it. But, you know, I don't see the, the rapture necessarily as a salvation thing but as the Lord selecting the first fruits, that which is ready, and letting the rest mature and ripen. You leave the rest in the sun to let it ripen and mature. I do believe that multitudes will be left to ripen and mature, to grow up in Christ and get right with God. I think it's far better to get right right now. And to be ready than to think, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to delay this. The Lord has delayed his coming. The bridegroom tarried. And, you know, when you have to wait and wait and wait, people get weary of the waiting and they think it's never going to happen. And they want they give up and they go on to other things. And it's real easy in the waiting to get involved again with the, this world and its ways. We actually live right now between verse 5 and 6. <laughs> That's where we're living right now. The Lord has delayed, his, or, or he's, he's tarried. He hasn't returned yet. But one day, one day there's going to be a trumpet blast that's going to pierce, pierce the sky and those who are ready. The, the cry will go forth. At midnight there was a cry, the bridegroom comes, go ye out to meet him. You know, the very fact that the Lord used this illustration about marriage, I believe it says something to us also about how this has to be a picture of a pre-tribulation rapture. Because remember, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, what was repeated, not only were they marrying and giving in marriage, marriage was used as the very illustration of life as usual. Life going on as usual. Life the way it is outside our doors right now. And even though life ain't what it ought to be outside those doors, we're not in the great tribulation. Half the population of the earth hasn't died. A fourth of the population hasn't died. The great tribulation is going to be unlike anything the world has ever seen. Daniel tells us that. The Lord tells us that. Jeremiah told us that. You know, I tried to do the numbers, Dave. I'm not good at numbers. But last week, the CDC said 600,000 Americans have died from COVID so far. That's a lot of people, 600,000. Also, we have a population of 331 million in America. So... My Chalmet calculations wound up with less than one-fourth of one percent. Less than, less than. It's a little more than an eighth, a little less than a fourth, less than one percent, one-fourth of one percent, less than one-fourth of one percent. It shut down the world. COVID closed the entire world, the whole world. <laughs> factories, factories closed. They still can't get, get factory goods out of things. Factories closed. Education closed. Sporting goods, sporting arenas, entertainment. You know what it was. We all lived through it. If the whole world closed, the whole world, for a fraction of a percent, what happens during the Great Tribulation when 50% of the population of earth dies? 
under judgments and plagues. Is it going to be life as usual? Are they going to be marrying and giving in marriage and waiting for the bridegroom? And No. This is a picture of the rapture. It's a picture of the rapture, and it's a picture that declares, I believe, If these percentages hold true, that maybe half will be ready. And maybe half think they're ready. And they'll find out too late they're not ready. Therefore, I encourage us all, in a time when the bridegroom's coming has been delayed, it's been delayed, we're, we're right there right now, but even long delay must not weaken our, uh, our resolve. It must not weaken our faith. Uh, we must not be deterred in our readiness, in our preparation, in our expectation. You know what happens with a long delay? You tend to get careless. You tend to get careless. If the goodman of the house knew what hour the thief would come... He would have been ready. That's right. And he would not have allowed his house to, to be broken in. So you can picture it this way. I'm not saying that this is necessarily the thing to do. If you really want to know what to do, you get you a great big giant dog. You get a great big giant dog that's bigger than you. So if a thief comes in, he better have made out his last will and testament. So. <laughs> but let's imagine... You knew somebody was going to break into your house at a particular hour. You would have, you would be waiting with 911 on speed dial. You'd have, your, you'd have a big old gun right by, right by the bed. And you'd have your little bitty dog and maybe your cat to protect you. you know, because, or maybe, you know, maybe your pet's a little chicken or some goldfish. Maybe that'll, maybe that'll do you some... But what if then, then you wait up, you wait up all night, you wait, and they don't show up. So you say, I'll be waiting the next night too. And they don't show up. And the next night, and the next night, and the next night. The next thing you know, you're going to bed at 9 o'clock. you got no gun on the bedstead. You, you asleep. The thief comes in when you're not expecting it. Point being, all of that just to make this point. We tend to grow careless. When there's been a delay. And we, we can't afford that. We can't afford that luxury to grow careless. And think that we're like the world. We must get it settled in our hearts, our minds forever. We are not like this world. We are not like them. We don't live like them. We don't think like them. We don't talk like them. We don't have their values. We don't share their values. We're not like them. Amen. We must not be like them. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Because the long-awaited day will come. Verse, the Bible says at verse 6, at midnight, there was a cry. The bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. And when that cry comes... Jesus is coming, whether we're ready or not. He's coming. In verse, in verse 10, the door was shut. That means the door is open right now to those who want to be ready, be right, be prepared, make amends, forgive, be forgiven. Do what you need to do to be right with the Lord. Because it's going to come and catch many unaware. They that were ready went into the marriage. That's readiness, preparation. I believe that this is a picture of a first fruits rapture. Sometimes the Bible refers to these as overcomers. I believe Revelation 12 gives us a picture of them as a man-child company, which I don't even have the time to begin to get into some of those passages right now. But... I do know this, the Bible says this door will be shut. It's open now, but it will be shut. And then those who are left behind will have a period of ripening. 
And perhaps, then too, there will be a rapture. I do believe it's possible there could be more than one. There are a lot of people who say there's going to be more than one resurrection. We already know there's been more than one. Uh, I mean, the Lord was resurrected from the grave. And so a whole bunch of other people that got resurrected from the grave at, at, at that time, uh, even though those guys died again. But the Lord is called actually the first fruits. But then you've got that Revelation 14 passage that calls that whole group in heaven the first fruits unto God. The, the, the tribulation's going on on earth, but here's this group in heaven. They are the first fruits, he said, Amen. unto God. They follow the Lamb wherever he went. There was no guile found in their mouths, and they were considered to be pure, without guile, without fault, before the Lord. None of us are faultless. Amen. None of us are perfect. You're right. Amen. But you know, when the Lord looks at his bride, he loves his bride. He loves his people. He loves his church. Amen. He loves you and me. And he sees us by faith, by our faith in Christ, our Savior. He sees us clean and whole and white and pure, despite our faults and flaws. And yet, I do believe, I actually hope I'm wrong, but I do believe there's going to be a separation at the midnight cry. I hope those who believe in a general rapture are right. But I'm concerned that they might be wrong. Amen. And that concern is an incentive to me to, to live right and stay right. Amen. Because all these warnings about being ready, being prepared, not, not being caught unaware, Amen. warnings are for a reason. They're for a powerful reason. Then you've got Revelation 19.7. I'm going to close with this verse, but Revelation 19.7 says this, The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. I do want to encourage us today by the grace of God, to do what we know we're supposed to do. That's all we can do, do what we know we're supposed to do. And pray that we be accounted worthy to escape all these things, Luke 21, 36, and to stand before the Son of Man, stand approved. That's, that's to be our prayer. There's nothing in this world that's worth holding on to. Amen. Nothing in this world you can keep. And therefore, don't let anything in this world, nothing that it offers, no sinful pleasure, no sinful activity, don't let any of it Amen. hold you back. Amen. Father, I pray today, I pray, Lord, for myself, Lord, and I pray for all of us present and all of us who, who, who hear my voice, Lord, that. I pray that we would be found among the ready. Lord, I pray that you forgive us, that you wash us, that you cleanse us of all that defiles us. Lord, we know that you would have a bride who is clean and white and without spot or without wrinkle. Lord, we want to be that bride. Lord, see us, see us completely immersed under the blood of Christ, we pray, that washes us from every stain and all guilt and shame. Yes. And help us, Lord, to live our lives in such a way that we honor you, that we bring honor to your name, yes. that, you, that you would be happy to call us sons, your sons and your daughters. Yes. Let us bear your resemblance, Lord. Let us bear your likeness. Let us be light. Let us be salt. Let us be ready. 
Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.